Hi, everybody. So Hello. glad to be here. Hi. Okay. We are calling this event, I well, I just like little slogans. I'm saying open your mouth and praise the Lord. And we we're talking about being faith-based on Facebook. And I'm here with my friends. We are all Midwest chicks, women. Um, however, we're living in Flagstaff, in Missouri, and in Florida. So I have Kim Meyer here. I have Julie Lundberg, and I have Tanya Brewer. And I'm so excited to have them. Between us, we have how many kids? You guys want to say it? 23 or more. <laughs> so far. There may be some on the way. Oh, oh yeah. Mm, don't speak too soon, Julie. <laughs> So we're going to take a second to just try to share um, this and anybody out there watching, go ahead and share this with um, on your Facebook pages or, you know, wherever you can, because, um, you know, we want this to be something that other people can watch and see. Yeah. Because, you know, I got it. I got it. It's all right. It's all right, because we're going to talk about the relevancy of being on um, on Facebook and really talking about Jesus and talking about our raw and real story. And this has been on my heart for quite a while. Okay, so I'm sh sharing this. Oh, wait. Hold on. Do you guys see it? Do you yeah. See it? Okay. We're on. Yeah. yeah. And okay, and I, I'm, I'm slow to, to the up. So I'm slow here. Um, it's all right. It gives everybody time to kind of come on. Give me a second. You think that I would have it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sharing. Okay. All right. So I apologize for the dog. All right. So here's the thing. I want to start with this. Um, in the Bible in Mark, it says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And I want to talk a little bit about some statistics regarding the church. First off, very important for us to say that we love the church. And this is not, you know, a way to bash traditional churches. In fact, it's a way to encourage growth um, during a time where a lot of people are seeing a decline. So here's some, here's some statistics that I found. It says in 1948, 22% of Americans identified as Catholics. In the early 1980s, that percentage climbed to 29%. By 2016, it went down to 22%. Okay, but this stability disappears when we start looking at Protestants. In 1948, most Americans, 68%, identify themselves as Protestants, and the number reached um, its peak around 1954, 1956, at 71%. And then we saw a pretty steady decline until we hit 37% in 2016, a drop of 31%. So church attendance, 20% of our population attends church. Over 70% are on Facebook. Okay, over 50% of people globally have a smart smartphone phone. 2.27 billion people come onto Facebook every single month. I may have to go into the other room if the dog keeps barking. Okay, we'll go. <laughs> so my point is, I've traveled globally. And everybody has a smartphone. You can go into the most impoverished nation of the world and people have a smartphone. But they're talking about the decline of the church. So the way I see it, we have such an opportunity here on Facebook where there's 2 billion people coming every single month. And each of us has networks to be able to reach you know, people from all over. And so we all have different stories. We have different messages. And I wanted to talk about four to four women that are close to me in my life, or friends online, and I want to talk a little bit about how I met them, um, and then I'm going to kind of have them explain them, uh, describe themselves. So I met Tanya Brewer through our uh, really spiritual father, Papa Ken Malone, and we are just connected that way and just kind of really hit it off and in just just really connected and then a couple months ago we we were talking and i had it on my heart the lord was really showing me how to minister to people online and to help christian leaders to get onto line and to uh, and online and to share their stories and so tanya has been doing i'll let her tell you a little bit about what she does in a second but 
the dog. Okay, Tanya, why don't you just go ahead and let us know a little bit about yourself and um, just share kind of what you're doing online as well. Okay. Uh, well, my story kind of falls in alignment with what you're talking about with church decline. Now, I have authority to speak in this arena because I I lead a church. So I, I, I this isn't, a, you know, this isn't a, you know, you know, like what you were saying, we love the church. We love the, the, the local community. But my story was that when I got saved, I entered into a church family. And ultimately what I got was a bunch of rules and regulations. So I fell in love with Jesus, but I wasn't stewarded to keep that intimacy with him. I just received a bunch of rules and regulations. After about 10 years of being in that environment, ultimately my story is I became, if I can be bold, I became dead to religion. I became, I was depressed. I was not happy. I didn't know anymore what kingdom looked like or who Jesus was because the character of who he was was not what I knew. And um, I just had this downward spiral, but didn't know it. I thought that that's what that meant to be, was to be a Christian, was to go down this downward spiral. I didn't know any different. And I had this radical encounter over about six years ago, and I radically woke up to the reality of Jesus. And he pulled me out of the trenches of that. <clears throat> and I woke up to that encounter with him. I realized that everything within me was starting to shake from what I knew versus what I had experienced. And so that began a, a, a progression of being able to basically wake up and come alive. So ultimately I got saved several times and I'm still continuing to get saved every single day and just moving from glory to glory. And so when you're talking about church decline, for me, there's this real, um, my story is I woke up, but I stayed. I didn't wake up, get offended and run away and go do my own thing. I woke up and I stayed. The problem with that is, is when I stayed, I offended everything around me. I, I walked out the reality of Jesus when you're trying to say, no, healing is for today. And you're being told otherwise, you're basically going in and you're flipping tables because whatever is authentic is going to naturally confront what isn't authentic. And so, uh, but, but through that, through, then your next question is, is what am I doing now? Through staying, the Lord basically took me through the parable of sitting in the back seat moving us to the front seat. And now we are the owners of the church I got saved in 15 years ago. So now we have the keys and with all of that, so we're still leading a local body, but the Lord for the last two years has been saying, you need to make your private public. I need this spoken about. Not everyone, they're still in the same place you were when you were on this downward spiral and you didn't know any different. I need you to make your private public. And I didn't know how to do that in a town of Flagstaff, you know, 80,000 people where there's hierarchy, competition, extreme religion, and everybody thinks I'm weird to begin with. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't have any influence in Flagstaff for the most part. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're getting there. But my level of influence was get away from me. You are, you're, you're right. Yeah. So the Lord has been telling me about two years ago, you need to get online. I don't know anything about online. It's my worst fear. I don't want to talk online. I don't want to have conversations with you ladies in public. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go live. I don't know anything about Instagram. She's talking to me about what is Instagram? Do you guys know that the next generation said that Facebook's for old people? Yes. yes. I am not old. <laughs> yes, I have five kids. Yes, I'm 37. But come on, now I've got to learn about Snapchat and Instagram. And it's yeah. like, this is crazy. But here's the thing, I wrestled with it for about two years. The moment I stepped out on obedience, the Lord said, just make your private public and I will show up. And I'll get into this later, but there's a scripture, a mantle over my life. And I don't know when you would want us to share that, but there's there's a there's a scripture over my life that that backs up making your private public. And and it's and it's extremely it's extremely powerful. So my story I heard that this morning, but I'm not sure where it is. Yep. <laughs> making your public private. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it has to do with the end of the gospel when Jesus rose and he decided to show himself to Mary. 
and he told them and he gave them a command and he said now go and tell the disciples that the you know where the angel said mm -hmm. go and tell the disciples that he has rose now here's the thing here's what's so powerful mm -hmm. the angel said go to galilee galilee is the den of heathens and it says jesus will show up there there's something about there's something that happens yes. when he shows up or an angel shows up in private reveals the reality of the situation implants it into you and says now go and tell the other disciples who are locked up and in fear because they're not going to believe and when that fell on me i began to wrestle in this place of i need to make my private public because it's exactly what happened he showed me an empty tomb and i woke up out of rules and regulations and i embraced the empty tomb and said he is alive and now it is time to run and tell all of the world that is so that's so relevant for what we're getting into too so okay so let's just we're I, we got to get back to that because that's going to be an important thing to talk about but let's so so i met kim through my pro-life princess um group and i'll just mention that a little bit i talk about making your public wait your private public <laughs> yeah. um briefly my story was years ago I started working on forums and then I was one of the first people on Facebook because my daughter was so young and she started on Facebook and I just started on there and it was during a time when I was actually writing my testimony as a mom of all of these kids that I have but the Lord said you have to tell your whole story and part of my story was this abortion story that I had and so I told the story and what I learned at that point was, and I built like a huge network from this um, years ago, which was a combination of adoption, because I have five adopted kids and pro-life causes where I would just write with blog posts and everything. And so it was very scary to make my private public. But I learned from that experience how important it is because it started to free people. Like they started to go, oh my goodness, me too, but I was too afraid. Or they messaged me and I learned that it was a ministry opportunity online and it grew massively and it grew so much that I had such a large, large network that when I was desperate to start a business and I didn't know how I, we were going to provide for our family, um, I just called out to the Lord and the Lord said, it's your network. And I also was very passionate about health and wellness. So I'm, I have a whole group that I call Adoptogenics. So everything that I've earned, like even the way I live, has been through the internet. And so fast forward, last year, I kind of was almost forced to tell my testimony with this regarding my, my being a Disney princess who had an abortion. And I started this group called Pro-Life Princesses. And the gifts from that were several hundred women that joined my Pro-Life Princess group. Well, some people you just really connect to. And Kim... Meyer is one of our pro-life princesses and I and she also is contributing to our pro-life princess blog that we're about to officially launch but it's there for life princesses.com um, and just Kim tell us a little bit about yourself and really you know kind of where you're at with this whole going online thing uh, you know okay so um, yes when I saw your piece that just stirred something in me because that is a story that needs to be told and I think a lot of people hide their story, just like what you were saying, Tanya. Um, transparency is everything because everybody's struggling. Everybody's got issues, but we need to tell our story. We need to um, give our point of view. So anyways, um, I've been feeling like a, for a long time. Okay, so I am a, um, a wife and a mama. I have six of my, of my own. I have four of those are boys. Um, so it's crazy in my house. Um, and I'm cool with that, but, uh, I'm also, so my husband is a youth pastor and then I have the honor and privilege of also being the children's director at our church. So all of this is been, you know, I think some people like they they think that like being a pastor, I know Tanya, you'll totally agree with this, but like being in like pastoral ministry, you think, um, like, oh, it's so like high and high, or, you know, something, but really it's just like being shoved out of your, your comfort zone for everyone to see. And, um, it's, it is like 
a big, huge stretch and it has done nothing but help me grow. And like, we're just growing with everybody else. Like we're just walking alongside of you and doing life with you. Like that's our, you know, that's our heart. And um, especially with youth ministry, I think that's very important for these young people to see uh, um, a husband and wife um, who like each other and, you know, they disagree, but yet they hold hands, you know? So, um, and then our kids, you know, they, I like, I bring my, my children along and I try to be there as much as possible. Cause I think that side by side ministry is just huge. And, um, like just that whole concept of these young people, like this upcoming generation, they gotta see, a like a stable home life. Like that's just so crucial in their lives. But Anyway, so along with this ministry, I just felt like God was just saying, okay, um, I want you to write a blog. And this was like seven years ago. Okay, so this is like before like blogs were even like cool, I, I think, or whatever. So I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Like, and I'm not really educated. You know, you know, you always talk yourself out of all this stuff. And so you just aren't, you feel unqualified. And I still feel that way. Um, but, uh, it wasn't until a few months ago <laughs> that I actually started writing. And a huge part of that was because of, uh, Deanna and the stuff that she's doing. And then, um, there's also another writer, um, and I can't remember her name right now, but, uh, she was addressing issues, you know, like, like what Deanna, like what you do. And um, just saying truth about whatever the issues, you know, going forth. I mean, everybody's online talking about it. You know, we we might as well. Like, I just felt like really start up like, OK, God, I see what you're saying now. And I started my Facebook page a couple of years ago. But I'm just like, eh, I'm not going to post, you know, about that. Like, I just been kind of hiding. So mm -hmm. this is good for me. But um, it is so important, like in this day and age, like we got to start speaking out. So this is like why I'm doing this right now is because like, there's a lot of negativity out there and everybody's talking about it. So it should be people that know truth. I know wisdom. Why should I be hiding mm -hmm. in my, yeah. you know, like in my community, like I, as much as I, like God has given me uh, wisdom on yeah. certain things, like he's revealing stuff to me. It's my job as a believer, just like you were talking about, like going in onto all the world. It's my job to relay that message to other people. And then it's, you know, the ball's in their court. They can take it or leave it. Yeah, that's awesome. And and um, it's just been fun sort of watching you kind of evolve too and, and write more and like come out more. And so I'm excited for people to kind of read what you had written on the blog post. So, okay, so Julie, we met through Adoptogenics, through, through a friend, but then we found that we had so much in common and I will kind of bring it over to you to kind of share, you know, your raw and real story, how you got online. And then we're kind of going to delve into, you know, kind of like the subject matter of, you know, should we be online? Like why? And, the, you know, why is God calling women out and all of that? So, um, Julie, I, I, I would love to um, to hear your story. And by the way, this is what one of your friends <laughs> Oh, I love Jen, Jen Miller. Hey, <laughs> um, she's such a great supporter. Um, and I, I've been thinking about that a lot. Like we can't do what we're doing without our awesome, like support group, our friends and our family who are so close and intimate with us, who are encouraging us and motivating us and supporting us to get out there online and to speak truth. Um, you know, there may be people who watch my stuff or um, see me live or, you know, hear me speak who don't know me, but the, the, the biggest group and um, the biggest thing and encouragement is friends and family, um, speak up and say, Hey, I'm here. I'm watching. I'm, you know, you're encouraging me. You, I, I, you know, appreciate what you're saying or even just, Hey, um, whatever it is. So thanks, Jen. Um, so my story I mean, I'm 36 as well, and I'm not old, <laughs> but Facebook is for old people. So here we are. <laughs> um, so in 2006, I lost um, twin girls from twin to twin transfusion, and uh, my life kind of started spiraling out of control. Um, and not really out of control, um, just I 
got back into the partying and um, alcohol scene. Um, I was a partier and a drinker, you know, in my young years. And um, I went right back to it um, as soon as I um, lost my twins. And so it was easy because, you know, I knew that lifestyle. Um, so <laughs> Deanna was, um, we were having a group message and she said something like <laughs> um, alcoholic or something like that. And I was like, hmm. And I like never want to call it an alcoholic, but I kind of was an alcoholic. So let's just call it like it is. OK, um, I drank a lot of alcohol and I liked it a lot. And I never thought I would ever, ever, ever get out of that lifestyle. All my friends, all my family, everybody was doing it. And so I did it and I had a lot of fun and um, I ain't going to lie about that. <laughs> so. Um, so. Like I said, call it what it is. I was. I spiraled out of control um, after I lost my twins. And um, me and my husband started dating. And um, he was a Christian, but I was not a Christian. I knew God, but I didn't really know who he was. And he would like talk about God like he knew him. And I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> and so I remember praying like, God, I want to be a crazy Christian. Like I wanted, I wanted that for my life. And now here I am, the crazy Christian. <laughs> and um, so I, it was about five years um, after I lost my twins when I was like, all right, I really need to do something about this negative lifestyle, this negative attitude. I was mean. I talked crap about a lot of people. I had very negative thoughts. I, um, I was not, I mean, my friends liked me when I was drinking with them, you know what I mean? <laughs> they still like me when I don't drink, but I was like my mindset and the way I thought about my life was not where I wanted it to be. So like about four or five years after I lost my twins, I'm like, I got to do something with my life. And it was about 2010 when God really revealed himself to me on an airplane um, coming home from Vegas. <laughs> I was on a four day binge in Vegas and he revealed himself to me on the um, airplane ride home. And I actually was like, OK, God, I surrender my life. And that was in April 2010. And, um, and in 2012, my husband and I started foster care classes. And um, by that time, I really wasn't a big drinker. I just would have a, you know, a beer here and there. And every once in a while, I'd go out and, you know, hang out with my friends and have a few more than one beer. But by that, by 2012, you know, I was kind of out of the party and lifestyle, which is a, is a huge praise. But I was still kind of here and there drinking and, um, a, a beverage or having an anxiety about like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to this restaurant with all these people and I'm not going to drink. And they're going to be like, oh, so it was a stronghold on me um, until about four. It was four years this last Christmas. I've been um, alcohol free and it's it's a praise and a testament to the Lord because I don't even I don't even want it. Um, and I don't care that other people are drinking. I can go to a restaurant and my friends can be having their drinks and it's totally fine with me. Like. I've just been called to let it go and it's not a stronghold any longer on me. And so in 2012, me and my husband <clears throat> started foster care and um, we adopted five boys out of the foster care system. And that season of my life was not like a fun season. And um, it was a, I, I was writing yesterday and I was calling it like the desert, the time where God was really trying to teach me how to like trust him and I just moved from my hometown one month ago and I feel like I'm living in the promised land <laughs> and it sounds so self-righteous to me. It's so I've been like researching it and it's okay to feel like you're living in the promised land. It's okay. It's not self-righteous. It's uh, the promised land is knowing that God's going yeah. to provide and trusting him ultimately mm -hmm. for all things. So yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I mean, the stories I, I actually I, I've had I have full interviews with Tanya and with um, Julie and they're amazing. And the, it's amazing. See me? See me? Do you see me now? OK, I froze for a second. There you are. Yeah, you were cutting out a little bit. Oh, that was so scary. OK, so wait, 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 wait. What I can see you on? now. Oh. Okay, so this the whole point is that we have these stories to tell. And when we tell the stories, people respond. And when they respond, they are freed. This is all about freedom. This is about the gospel, about, about coming in and showing them the truth of how you were 
freed, you're brought into the light and they can be too. And how can we reach them if they're not coming into the churches um, when there's 2 billion people coming online and they may be able to relate, they may be able to find Julie with a hashtag or Kim with a hashtag or me with a hashtag by putting pro-life in or Christian, you know, motivational Monday or Tuesdays with Tanya, you know, they can find that and they can be inspired globally. And so Facebook, I praise God for Facebook, but it's a matter of how we're using it. And so I've got a couple more facts that I kind of wanted to throw down. And then I want to ask you guys some questions, which I think is going to be really helpful for people. So I learned, that we speak 126,000 words a week. That's Every right. day we open up our mouths 700 times and we speak 18,000 words a day. So basically every week we speak enough words to fill an entire book. Um, every month we could write like 10 books based on what we say. And so <laughs> the scripture, it's wild. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians, and I'm just going to kind of give some you know, background for why it is relevant and why it is biblical for us to be able to speak into this new territory of social media online. Okay, so Second Corinthians five twenty. We are therefore for Christ and Christ's ambassadors, and though God and through God, um, we're making His appeal. And though, as I'm sorry, as though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you as Christ's behalf on Christ's behalf. Oh, you're cutting out again. Um, 15, are you guys good? I can't quite hear you. I, oh, it's not good. Okay, let me move over here. Okay, can you see me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm staying here. Uh, but, in, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentle, gentleness and respect. So to review, the church is declining. Facebook is growing. People are on their smartphones or on their uh, more so than their actual Bibles. They even go in church to their smartphones for the Bible. Um, God tells us to spread the good news and partner with him in sharing what we know. Plus every month we speak so many words. So why not? Right. So I want to ask, I'm going to start with Tanya, but I'm going to ask you guys a few questions that I feel are relevant for so many people who are based on, um, you know, whether it's YouTube or whatever to spread the good news. Okay. Um, Tanya, are you hearing me? Cause I see myself frozen every now and then. Yeah. Okay. What prompted you to take God's message online? And just give give me one second. Also talk about um, kind of when you felt like God speaking into your heart, um, even even when you heard from him in the beginning. And um, when did you feel God calling you to speak or encourage or teach or spread the gospel? And then tie it in a little bit to the social media piece. When did I feel him ask me to spread the word in general, right? Is that the question? Yeah, or when you heard God speak to you and how, you know, how, what is your basis for feeling like it's a relevant time for women, especially to speak up using social media? Um, well, like my, like my story, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was relevant until I woke up. I was told, go home and ask your husband the questions. Don't, there was a, there was a level of women can't be leaders. Um, women are not to be influencers. If you, if you have qualities where you're a businesswoman, I'm a dental hygienist. I'm in the marketplace. I have five children. They all came out of me. Um, <laughs> I have many adopted uh, kingdom sons and daughters. I mean, many. And, and it's just continuing to grow all over the world. And, and, um, and so, but I had that, that, that happened after I woke up, but before it was put your apron on and stay home. And I come from a line of women that were powerful, not that staying home isn't powerful. They were powerful in staying home and being extremely huge influencers. I'm talking like in the encyclopedia. So that's my bloodline. I'm a first generation Christian 
and I'm trying to reconcile this bloodline where I am amazing at home. I can whip up and cook. I mean, my husband's African American. He would not have married me if I was a typical white girl that <laughs> salad and then it. <laughs> I hope you guys know me. At my, I, I'm white. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Sometimes the African American community is represented on this call. Who <laughs> has? Five, I have three, and trust me, my kids wouldn't accept me if I didn't throw something down in the kitchen, too. So just saying. I mean, that's how my husband knew that I was the one was that I could eat a rack of ribs, you know? Like, mm -hmm. there's just something with, you know, with those cultures. And I just want to make sure that we do put that out there because we are four white women, right? And, and, and there, but there is so much to our story. You don't, there is so much to our history. There are so many different things that we're standing on the wall for that we are, are um, that we're, we're just standing on the wall for. We're trying to bridge the, the gaps in, yeah. in many yeah. different things. So I don't want to say that being powerful means that you're not at home because I'm throwing down, taking care of five kids. I, I cook, I clean, I own two homes, I, you know, but I also got an education. I'm a dental hygienist. I'm in healthcare. I am the lead, um, actually the apostolic oversight of a local, uh, of a local um, sons and daughters center, uh, a church, if you will. Um, there, there's regional influence and now there's international influence. So however, none of that came into my destiny until after I woke up. Yes, I had children. Yes, I had husband and I had one aspect of the kingdom, but I thought that was the only aspect. When I woke up, God started adding that there's more to Proverbs 31 than just a couple of lines in the scripture, like laugh at the days to come. I'm not kidding. The moment I would post like what Kim was saying, what, the moment I would say something about even having joy, it was like, that's from the devil. You're not allowed to laugh. I'm, what? This is correct. This is not coming from the world, you guys. This is coming from the church culture that proclaims the name of Jesus. And you're telling people that it's not godly to have joy. <laughs> I, I it, it blows my mind. So, so what happened was after I woke up, I started un slowly over six years. He started to unlock. Honestly, if I'm just being honest, I think um, Julie talked about self righteous. I actually got delivered from extreme self-righteousness. When I got married, yeah, there were things in our marriage. I mean, we had we struggled through pornography. And a lot of people would be like, oh my gosh, but you should have seen me. My self-righteous state was absolutely appalling. And so, so what happens is when you get delivered from something, God brings the real. So there's something about being his it's standing in his righteousness. You know, it's no longer self-righteousness, but giving him the glory to, to be in his in his righteousness. And so what happened was he started to implant in me that I'm allowed. He started to grant permission. You're allowed to laugh. You're allowed to talk. I was so muted. It was as if in the spirit, I my lips were sewn. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what's crazy. My husband is the biggest advocate for women and being launched forward. Absolutely my, I mean, he he's my biggest, it didn't come from the home, it was coming from the culture I was born into. <laughs> That's why it was so like, okay, this is not what I know in my family, but this is what's happening over here. So slowly over six years, he started to say, you have permission. You have permission to be bold. You have permission to go public. That meant in my workplace, I was allowed to be crazy at work. I'm a dental hygienist, my office knows who I am. I mean, we will be in the middle of a staff meeting. My legs start shaking and they know. <laughs> and they say it. Well, this is an office that has actually proclaimed atheism. They respect and they honor. There is something about your character. There's something about in your integrity. And now where my coworkers will call me and say, will you pray for me? Will you talk to that guy that you know about? Absolutely. And, and it's a fun thing, you know? And so there's some, but that would happen slowly start in your workplace. Then it would be pray for somebody at the grocery store. I mean, I had been a Christian for 15 years and I didn't even pray for people. Yeah. I mean, I've been every single Sunday up, hallelujah, I'm praising, I'm doing the talk. But then when it came time to driving down the road, it was like, I'm irritated, I'm mad, I'm frustrated, definitely want that glass of wine. I, I, I wasn't praying for it. I didn't do anything with the gospel. I was a hoarder. 
I took in the gospel, I kept it for myself, and I lived a hypocritical life saying that I love Jesus while I walked around being a horrible mom, being a horrible wife, full of self-righteousness, and I never spoke about the name of Jesus unless I wanted to judge somebody. <laughs> yeah. Well, first off, one of my favorite thing about you is when you snort, when you laugh, it always makes me laugh so hard. And then I fall out laughing. You're not doing it that well. I'm not going to listen because I can't. But <laughs> you said a couple things. I'm kind of going to go off a little bit. You said you were muted. And then you said you hoarded things. And I think that right there, I feel like we should talk about that because so many women feel muted. And I think sometimes, yes, it's, it's external, but I think it's here too, because I tell people all the time, okay, so you want to speak? Speak. All we need to do these days is hold up our phone and speak. You know, yeah. if you feel like we have a message, a gift to give somebody, and, and don't even judge it. Maybe one person will see it. Maybe it'll be that one person. But a lot of times it's self-inflicted, you know. Like I write things and sometimes nobody says anything, right? And other times it's like, whoa, how is it that that went like viral? I don't even know. So we, we can feel like we're muted, but sometimes it's that we don't understand that we are called to speak up, irregardless if somebody gives us permission. So I want to hear what you guys have to say about that. Um, I grew up, even before my dad left the home, the family home, I remember like <laughs> children are meant to be seen, not heard, you know? So I grew up at a very young age, just close your lips, be quiet. And I noticed um, in the first couple of years of becoming a mom that I did the same to my kids. Um, and in the last few years, like two to three years, I've been really trying to focus on not being like children are meant to be seen, not heard <laughs> and letting them have, you know, being able to open their mouth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I understand what she's coming from and you know like the generational like curses and the generational sin like we we grow up in these communities and it's we're not we're trying to like you know i'm not trying to like um say anything negative about our families or where we grew up in because god places us where you know where we are um but we grow up you know how we grow up in these generational curses strongholds and sins they they can you know follow us throughout adulthood until we can figure out, you know, what, what's going on. Yeah. I mean, and so Kim, when you, when you hear Tanya speak about this muted aspect, like you are, you have six kids, you live in a really rural area, correct? Like it's not yes. like you're in the city with a ton of people around. And I think a lot of women, um, I think why that they're so effective online is because other people can relate to that kind of, almost like a feeling of isolation. I know, I, I think we've all had feelings of isolation, but when you hear this aspect of being muted and yet you're a blogger and like, what is it within yourself that really feels like, hey, I'm gonna write this down. Like, is there something that tells you somebody needs to hear my story? Like, what inspires you to do that? Um, I guess it's just Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're gonna say this now, or hey, you know, now's the time for that. Cause a lot of things will stir up in me and I'll get a little amped up about it, you know? And, but it won't be the right time. Um, but then Holy Spirit will be like, Hey, you know, now's the time and because you just never know who's going to be reading at what time, you know, whatever. But, um, in Ecclesiastes, you know, it, when he's talking about how, you know, there's a time and a place for everything and, um, that the there's, I think it's, yeah, first seven. So Ecclesiastes three, seven, he said, you know, there's a time to tear and a time to mend, um, a time to be quiet and time to speak out. And um, I just, you, we have to like lean into that because sometimes we can be running our mouths and be totally right, but it'd be totally the wrong time. And so, uh, uh, and that is the struggle is real girls because yeah. we are always ready to run our mouths. Like, yeah. but it, so it has to be, my only answer to that is Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is the only one that could be like, okay, it's it's time to like say or whatever. Now being within the church, um, like outside of, uh, like outside of the blog area or social media, um, like the other night, because I believe that God does everything with decency and in order. So 
um, like the other night, God gave me a word for the students during worship time. And uh, so I didn't just go up and just give my word because God told me to. I did it in order. So I went to my husband and I said, hey, I feel like God is telling me to give this word to these um, to them right now. Um, are you okay with that? And so he's like, absolutely. So, you know, he gives me the microphone and then I go. So I don't know if that helps, yeah. but like yeah, just, um, you know, so it's like indecency and in order. So you're under the submission that God has placed in your life. Um, but you know, like you're still being obedient. Like, so I still was obedient cause I still don't like my flesh doesn't want to grab the microphone and do it. Right. But I need to be obedient to whatever he's telling me to do because somebody needs that word. Yeah. Oftentimes reluctant with that word. And yet it's sometimes he gives us that word in a really inconvenient time. <laughs> but yeah. um, I think this is so good because you mentioned something about, I mean, we were talking about women and, and so speaking out in the time you're talking about the timing. I want to know, haven't you, have you guys observed that this message of it's time for women to speak up is like, whoa, so many people are hearing this right now. And why do you think that is? I mean, obviously we'll just be, but you know, you know, I love how God works that sometimes you're like, I'm so sure this is my own original idea. <laughs> and then you start talking to other women. They're like, me too, me too, me too. And so what, how do you guys feel about, when we say there's a time for everything, you know, under, you know, under heaven or whatever. Um, it seems like this is a time that he's calling women out. And so wh uh, why do you think it's relevant for Christian women to speak out now? It's a big, big question. Anybody want to? Um, well, with my motivational speaking business, um, it, I mean, it is, it is time. And so like, sometimes I can talk myself out of it. Like, there's so many motivational speakers out there. There's so many people telling their story. Um, how do you think that you have something to give? Um, but God has created us all differently. We all have different stories. We all have different lessons we've learned within the same type of stories. Um, so, you know, uh, tell me the, what's the question again? Christian women speaking out. So, I mean, it is, it is, it's time for Christian women to speak out. <laughs> yeah. And I do think he's calling so many people. And we just had our whole, there was a series that we did on the apostolic women like Tanya. Wasn't that awesome when we did that? And I just, right before this call, my friends Donna and TNG were on and they were talking about women speaking. And, you know, you talk about motivational speaking. I mean, they're like getting back to Facebook. 2 billion people every single month. There is room for everybody to have an audience. Like I think the first time, or I call them social congregations, the first time that Tanya and I were on, and even when I was on with TNG, we were like, oh my goodness, this is like a mega church. It's like the video went to like, you know, a few thousand people in the span of like, I don't know, 48 hours. But even, even if you went to like, a thousand or whatever and you did that a couple of times a week you are reaching your reach is so huge and all of those churches that are like oh my goodness nobody's coming nobody's coming i feel like this is a time for us to speak up because they're not coming and the lord is saying look to show them okay i need to i'm going off topic a little bit because we kind of had a couple questions we were thinking of but i need to say this what i see if we don't speak up online what I see is the whole entire gospel being like shoved aside and being so irrelevant to the future generations because what happens is that they don't even know. Like they do not even know. They don't see an example of a woman who is a Christian woman. They don't see an example of people who are willing to speak truth. They don't see the boldness. They don't see people birthing their dreams because we decided that we're just going to stay in the building and not go into the mission field where they all are. If we know that people in the middle of Malawi are holding this phone, even though they can't get a meal and we're not willing to go online and speak our truth of what God is saying. And somebody might be drawn to Tangi. Somebody might be drawn to Tanya. Somebody might be drawn to Julie or Kim more than they are to the other we have an opportunity. And so I just feel like 
like the, the churches in my opinion, aren't understanding this enough. I still see people handing out, no offense, cassette tapes and DVDs. People don't even have a DVD player on their laptop anymore. Make it, you know, um, electronic, digitize it. Like, let's get into this media aspect and and not not like look down at it. I mean, there's an aspect of entertainment at this point. I'm, a, I'm sorry, but that's how our society is. And so we need to speak up so that we can go to where the people are and each one of us can be an influencer. Okay, I said my little speech. So, um, <laughs> so the, only, the, only, like, the only name that everybody in the whole world knows is Jesus. I yeah. mean, so like the people who go before us, uh, the evangelists who were before us, the motivational speakers who were before us, the mamas who have six to 10, 15 kids, whatever it is, those people have went before us. People don't know who they are now. Like we are here, we are in this generation. We are to be speaking to this generation and this generation is online. Right, and how, but if the generations before us, we're so blessed to have these stadium events coming, but in every generation you need, like Jesus spoke to the people, like in their culture, like how they were. And so we need to speak to the culture and how they are. So that's why I love when I see like Kingdom Gate which is sort of like my church, even though I, though I do home church, when they're putting it online, you know, I love that churches are taking things live and putting it in. Like I can't go to all of the send tours, but I can watch it online. I love seeing that so much, but I feel like we need to press in even more and talk about what is this? What is it? This is so important. It's so important. You could have 75 people in a room for a conference and then have it spread to 50,000 people. So we, it has to be a marriage of both of them together so that we can really touch the generations that are moving forward because we don't know. All churches may be online in the future. I mean, I think we need, to, this, is, this will segue into something that I wanna talk about. The relevancy, even though we love this, the relevancy of face-to-face -face fellowship. And I think, you know, especially Tanya and Kim, since you guys have your churches, how to balance that because it is very relevant to have actual fellowship. So how would you how would you talk about kind of balancing that and how do you? I mean, Tanya, you do both. Yeah. Well, I think uh, our perspective, I love how you said that Jesus, you know, he talked to the culture. The words he used was based on the culture he lived in. And a lot, a lot of people say, oh, that's, you know, that's a biblical word. And it's like, no, let's, you know, there were things that he did so that people that, that he was talking to were able to understand what he was even saying. And I think that ultimately, I think that what it is, is, and I've released this a couple of times, there's this, this and anointing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that we are going to want to do a pendulum swing. And go well. The church isn't relevant, so let's just right. pendulum swing all the online or all online. You know, at one point, you know, whatever pendulum swing over to right. The thing about in my life, for me, when he says the word ecclesia, he says governmental family. Yeah, I personally do not operate our church as church ministry over here and family over here. It's the same. Our sons and daughters are our sons and daughters. So we live life. We don't show up on Sunday, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, never talk to you again. Don't, I, I you know, I'm going to go sit in heaven and then I'll come and release a word and then you're never going to see me again. It, it's family. Now, don't get me wrong. It is not just fellowship. We don't just hang out and eat dinner. It is a governmental family. There's an aspect of the local community that needs to come together to shift regions, to shift the way that, um, the way that things are operating in your community. It's not to have a great potluck. You can have a good potluck, but it's not just a good potluck. You are to take dominion. You are to come together as a family. But I'm telling you, you will not get unity if you're not dwelling with one another. You don't dwell with one another if you're only meeting once a week. Right. So something for me that we just happen to carry a very strong mantle for a local family to where there is extreme discipleship. We live with one another. We dwell with one another. His commanded blessings fall on those who dwell. And so we dwell, we live life, we walk, we walk life. It's not a church service. It's governmental family. That is huge. Yeah. And now he's stretching me to operate in that level online. And to be honest, I have no idea 
I mean, Tuesdays with Tanya is kind of blowing up and it's freaking me out. I mean, in one Tuesday, there's like 600 comments. And I'm like, I can't even get five a amen sometimes when I preach. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like all of a sudden you're online and people are like commenting and they're communing with one another. I don't know what this is going to look like, discipleship online. But what I do know is we need both. Because if I just stay here, I'm missing out on Canada. I'm missing out on Japan. I'm missing out on New Zealand. There are women and families in Japan that are looking for that language and they can't find it in their little neighborhood. They're yeah. searching for the, they're, they're searching for the next, they're, not the next, they're searching for a, the, the next glory. They're searching for, they're realizing there's something more than this shot in the arm sermon once a week. There, right. and, and that's just the church community. The world is searching for something that is authentic and powerful, yeah. transparent and powerful, not weak and transparent, but powerful and transparent. The world is looking for something that's authentic and they're not finding it. Some of the people that I've been meeting in the last couple of months, they wouldn't find it if they weren't getting it online. Because right. honestly, one of the things that I release is I have to be effective with my finances. I would love to go to Japan and I will, but I'm not there yet. But it doesn't mean that my voice should be capped until we get there. I can't fly to Japan at the drop of a hat because I do have a family and I got to cook my husband some ribs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I can reach and build relationship yeah. online. Yeah. You know, um, Papa Ken just said, he goes, let's do one on, you know, sonship and, and that, but it's like, I was literally just thinking about mentorship and how it's not really people don't see mentorship anymore and this is going to sound like i'm going all the way off on like a whole different subject but for example years ago in the villages when somebody needed to learn how to breastfeed what would they do they'd watch other women right we don't have that type of thing anymore now i'm talking about not breastfeeding but i am talking about church when you go online as tuesdays with tanya you're talking about you know you're doing a word right However, when we see like, let's say, let's say Kingdom Gate or Kingdom Airs or whatever uh, live streamed online, what we're offering and showing people is what a church service can look like. It's right. a, a form of mentorship. And that's what the what online um, brings us is that we can actually ch plant churches in other places just by them seeing what it's like to, you know, to exit, to, to, to create church. Some people don't know what it's like. I will tell you, I, I remember the first time I walked into a church where they were raising their hands. I had no idea what that meant. Now we can open up our smartphones and see people flying flags. And they're like, what does that mean? You know, this is a different, this is an opportunity for us at such a huge scale um, that it's, it's, it's just massive. Kim, were you, did, did I interrupt you? Because I know you wanted, didn't you want to say something? <laughs> Not really. I mean... I mean, the only thing that I would I would just chime in and just totally say amen to everything Tanya was saying, and just because we need church, we need the church body because people need encouragement and they need accountability. Because I my past was a lot like Julie's, and had I not been connected to church, had I not been connected with people that were saying you know that were helping me out of a pit, I never would have gotten out of the pit. I never would have met my husband. Like, so the church body is crucial. It was actually my first video that I did online. My very first, it was why church? Why do we go to church? Because this is such an epidemic. People are not seeing the need to go to church. But I, I also sense like right now, it's almost like a time because it's like, we've been racking our brains for like this young generations, like this 18s, 20s, you know, whatever, like how do we reach them? You know, we're trying all these different things to try the, to draw them into the building, but their life is in their hands. It's in their phones, you know? And so I love this whole concept. Julie is like totally expanding my thought process with the way she's um, motivating people like through one-on-one -on -one. Um, you'll have to go into that, Julie, because that's powerful stuff. But just because I asked a group of people that I did not know, I was at a restaurant, we were on vacation, and I asked these young people, and I said, um, they were doing a Bible study, and I noticed it was like at a bread co. And I said, what is causing you to do this? Like, what is 
getting you into a place that you desire to do this at your age. And they all had different stories. They all had different backgrounds. And the number one thing was there was a woman that was sitting with them who was like their mentor. And she was speaking into their lives. And they said, we just want somebody to care about what we have to say. We just want somebody to listen. And so um, this is just huge because this group of women right here is just blowing my mind on how that can be done. And um, I just, I get excited uh, just about that one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship thing because sometimes I don't have the time to maybe go out to lunch, but I can Marco Polo or I can <laughs> whatever so it's it's good it's it's powerful stuff it's really good I love it so, so what you're great. saying and then I'm gonna bring Julie on to talk about that but it's funny because we kind of accidentally came full circle into the aspect of sons and daughters which is something that is very very close to our hearts and um, uh, you know like I said we have a spiritual father with Ken Malone like a Tanya, Tanya and I do, but but mentorships. We are spirit. We are mothers, spiritual mothers to other people, and I think we all are. And it doesn't matter what age we are. We have an opportunity to mentor. And people, if we're sitting in a coffee shop, I mean, Tanya's going outside of her church on Sundays and having her service on another day in order to minister to people in the community. And you mentioned, and I'll have Julie talk about this in a second. But Marco Polo, like this is an app that I literally, my girlfriend has like a multi six figure coaching program where she's just Marcoing everybody every day. She has 16 people. She's like, we have to touch each other every day. So we'll talk to each other. You look in their faces and you can talk. And so this is how we can be with each other. We can mentor each other as well online. So Julie, what were you, what was Kim alluding to regarding? Um, <laughs> well, I just met Kim online. <laughs> <from> <laughs> like two days ago. Right. And so, um, Kim inboxed me and was talking to me about this live, you know, um, just kind of, Hey, what's going on? And, you know, just kind of get to know each other a little bit. And so that's kind of my life these days. Like that's how I get to know people like online through instant messenger. Um, and really God placed on my heart, like about a, like about a year ago to that's what I needed to do um, because he's called me to mentor. Like I always say I'm a mom, a mentor and a motivator. Um, so he's called me to mentor, but it's hard to go to the coffee shops. It's hard to get together all the time. It's hard. You know, for me, it's hard once I get there to leave, you know, and I know that sometimes I only got like 20 minutes, but I'll be there for three hours. So sometimes it's easier to, you know, have the conversations, get to know the people on the instant messenger, but obviously, coming together when the time is necessary too, because I do, I thrive off of one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations face to face. Um, but God was showing me a new way um, with, because the, the age range of about um, uh, late teens to like early twenties, mid twenties, that age range is like a, um, is a group that God's calling me to. And he's saying they're online. Um, so mentor them online or, you know, if they're reaching out to you in instant messenger, have those conversations, you know, for, for a long time, I didn't, didn't want those extra, um, extra things to do online. But, um, so she reached out to me over instant messenger and I was like, Hey, do you have Marco Polo? And she said, yes. And so we went back and forth a few times on the video and we probably talked our faces off, <laughs> but it was nice because you could, you know, have the conversation <laughs> And then walk away from it and do what you need to do with your family and cook your dinner, cook your ribs <laughs> and, you know, stuff like that. So the Marco Polo app has been life changing. My 21 year old daughter showed me that Marco Polo app. And now I'm on it with my mother and I'm on it with Yana and I'm on it with Kim. And I, I use it very, very often. And my boys love to get on it and show grandma what we're doing, you know, since we've moved away and my sisters are on there and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just saying like, I'm encouraging people to not be afraid to get to know people through the instant messenger or the Marco Polo app, because yeah. it can be life changing. Some of the things that Kim was saying to me yesterday and even, I mean, we won't go into all that, but this, it was encouraging and motivating to me. And I'm sure I, I know I did because she told me that I, you know, made motivated her. So, I mean, God gave me that gift to encourage and motivate. So that's what yeah. I'm going to do. And, and if we just we just have time for like a couple more things that I want to address. But the one thing that I will say, if we just even look at this picture here with this four grids, we with the exception of Tanya, who I met in person. So just to, 
here's the thing. Everybody's people complain about the church not going out and doing enough. Like there's it's like, oh, they've got their four walls and they just stay there. They don't go out. Social media is an opportunity for us to go out. We can go out and connect with people all week. So anyhow, I end up meeting Tanya and I'm like, ooh, Tanya would be great because let's let's do this thing. And then I'm like, oh, Julie, I've talked to Julie before, but Julie and I met online, right? Well, through our through the business, but we kind of met online. Yeah. And then I met Kim online. Then I talked to Kim. I was like, why don't you do this? And then I discovered that Julie just moves from Illinois down to uh, Missouri, and now they only live 50 minutes away, and now they're going to become best friends. So oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what ministry looks like, and mentorship looks like. So, and and Tanji said the best thing. This is how we build relationship. This just sounds like relationship. And that it's very, very true because that's what God wants. That's what the Lord wants, relationships. And the thing is, people want to know who they connect to. They want you to be raw and real and share your story, and they will see the relationships, you know. So I just, um, a couple, two more questions. One, um, or maybe it's a comment, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. Um, here's the thing. I'm trying to figure out how to move this thing down. Um, hi, Thomas. Okay. Uh, I believe there's a warning that needs to be put out there regarding social media. It's very narcissistic. And there's several warnings that I have or little points that I want to make. Number one is that as Christian women and men using social media, the enemy will use the, the label narcissistic uh, coming out of the mouths of people that are actually you think should be supporting you because they may see us out there and they and oftentimes like that I've been accused of oh my gosh she just wants to hear herself talk and the thing is is that when you feel a calling and God is calling you sometimes this happens it can be really it can appear to be narcissistic now on the other hand it's very true that it can kind of feel overwhelming at sometimes and sometimes you can feel like you have to like if you really get into the circles of all these people coaching people on social media it's like well are you online enough are you doing this enough are you doing it? it's this performance thing and i believe we have to still be led by the holy spirit have to be led by the holy spirit i do believe that if we are called that we should have some kind of consistent messaging but not feel like we need to just continually be led by the holy spirit but understand that some attacks may come because we're, this is new territory. But the new territory is being taken over by so many people. Christians are coming in and coming in. And the more influence we have on Facebook, the less we're going to see Christian uh, pages being suppressed because the more um, present we are, we're not going to be as unusual. And the enemy isn't going to have more power and authority over us to be able to say to the Facebook you know, team or whatever, hey, we don't want to hear those Christian voices. If the Christian voices are loud enough and more and present enough and we're all over the place, then there's no choice but to give us some kind of authority in that medium. So I think that the, the warning is to not let it be something where it's like, oh, look, I had 5,000 views and I had, the, you know, like in order to understand the perspective of what it is in our lives. And do you guys have anything that you want to say about that or think? Or the only thing that I would add is that we have to recognize that he's he's going to give us tools. And the, the mindset is, is you can either serve it or it can serve you. Yeah. And it's the same thing with finances. A lot of people want to say, if you have a lot of finances, that must mean you be a lover of money. And I say, I just make finances serve me. I don't serve finances. That's actually poverty. And so I, I think that the truth about it is that social media is absolutely a tool, but it's going to serve me. And, and one of the ways that I've been able to pray is ask Holy Spirit, I don't want to look like anyone else. You give me those downloads. Let me break the code of Facebook. Let me break the code of Insta. I don't even know if that's the right language, but I've asked Holy Spirit, let me break something because I don't know what this is and I don't want to fall trapped to what the world says to do, but God says that we can do something. And when you follow his blueprint, you're going to be able to break those things and then utilize the tools that are there. And I think foundationally, I think Tangie hit the, hit the nail on the head that it's about relationship, right? Nobody would fault you for getting on FaceTime and 
FaceTiming your mother who lives in, like my mom lives in Tucson and I've got, she's got five grandbabies in Flagstaff. Nobody yep. would say that that's weird. That's really, that's what I'm afforded right now is phone calls, texts, Marco Polo. I'm on Marco Polo. Vox, you know, like we voice, I have to hear, people need to know me. I'm not a text person. I need, I need to talk as you guys can tell. Voxer, using these different tools, not because I'm subject to it, because it's subject to me. And I think a lot of this is when we're, when we're going out and we're using these tools, we're absolutely building relationship. And as long as you're recognizing, I firmly believe that none of us want to put a Band-Aid on things. We want reformation, transformation, and, re and, and we, want re we, like, we want a revolution. Yeah. We want it to be sustainable. In order to do that, I firmly believe relationship is what's going to do it. It's not yeah. going to be a sermon. It's not going to be what we do on, on social media. But it's about those connections. And sometimes those connections, this is all we're afforded. So why not use the tool to serve us? You know, I want to share something um, that this is, this is important to <laughs> And alone, he says, you daughters have provoked me to begin doing this. Okay, so let me point paint a picture for my my other two sisters here who don't know uh, Ken Malone. So basically, I felt very alone in in Orlando. I didn't really have any church leadership. And honestly, I was to the point where I kind of was like over with church. You know, I just felt that way. But I love Jesus so much. My friend Alicia, who was in... Um, I don't know where we met. I think it was in Kentucky. I don't know. Maybe she's on. But anyhow, she tells me about Ken. I meet Ken. And Ken basically, you know, opened up my eyes to the magnificent state of Florida and how the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to go out on a limb and, and say it now. It's looking right now like the Holy Spirit is like, like God himself loves Florida the most. I mean, <laughs> but anyhow, my point is, He's saying you, your, you daughters have provoked me to begin doing this. And I want to say something to him. Um, I love that he is truly a forerunner in every single way. Like he's a forerunner in the way that he looks at things. He says we're aligned, um, you know, and, and that he's there for us. But, you know, go with the Holy Spirit. Do your thing. He ordained me. He ordained Tanya, I believe. And, you know, so many people that I know, along with Dutch Sheets. And he's just brought so much to us. But. I want to encourage him because when he says, you provoke me to begin doing this, when we think of all of the people that we know, like recently I was, you know, listening to some older, like um, on YouTube, I was listening to some amazing um, old sermons of some people, right, that were so powerful and because they were digitized finally. You know, a lot of people have a huge sphere of influence. He has a very large sphere of influence. And just going online to be able to touch people, it's very, very true that he has a huge ministry that he ha hasn't even been tapped into yet. And so I want to encourage people who are in their you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, and to actually give you a little bit of a statistic, because Tanya, you were mentioning something about Instagram. Actually, a lot more uh, younger people are coming back a little bit to Facebook. Um, Instagram also is expanding the demographic. But um, Facebook um, and social media in general, the baby boomers are on it more than the millennials. Uh, social media in general, they they watch they're watching what we're doing right now on their televisions because it's digitized and brought. They can bring in YouTube and Facebook online. Like that demographic is actually very very powerful and very very loud on social media, and we don't even think about it. They're consuming. They're on their phones more than the millennials. 